so welcome back, everyone. Um, today, we're going to be talking about uh, JSON, JavaScript uh, Object Notation. Um, has anyone heard of JSON, out of curiosity? OK, so a few of you. OK, very good. Um, but before we do, I think it's important that we review um, what objects and arrays are. Um, so let's begin with that. And then once we understand objects and arrays, or we review them, then we'll move on to what JSON is and how it's useful. So if you recall from previous discussions, an object is nothing more than a container, right? It can contain name, value, pairs, or key value pairs, depending on how you want to think about it. So the way to construct an object is by using these curly brackets. Can the people in the back see the code? Yes? OK. So what I've done here is I've created an object. This is an object that I've then put into a variable called a. OK, got your attention. So once I have a, I can now place values into a. So I can do a dot, let's say, name. Hello. Right? I can then put a dot age, for example, 13. A dot foo, two. A dot bar, zoo, et cetera, et cetera. I can also just as easily put other objects into the object, right? So I can say a dot, you know, boo, and then put an object into it. I can then a dot boo dot foo, three. Does this part make sense to you? What this is saying is refer to the, whatever value boo has inside of a, that would be this object here, and then add a foo to it that has a value of three. So that means if I console.log a.boo.foo, what would that print? Three. Does that make sense? OK. I can then, inside of foo, do a.boo.foo, no. The do some other object. And then I can do a dot boo dot do dot name. Yay. And then I can print a dot boo dot do dot name. And get yay. Let's visualize this. So let's use a debugger, which is one our best tool for visualizing the code, right? So let me zoom in. Create a breakpoint. So watch this. So in the first pass, we create an object that we place into A. Here you can see that A has an object inside, right? Then I add an age to a name, an age, a foo, a bar. And now if I open up A, look, it has an age of 13, a bar of zoo, a foo of three, and a name of hello. Does that make sense? OK. Once I do that, I can then add a boo to it that has an object. See, boo, which is an object. So an object has, an, has a value, or an attribute, I should say, of boo that refers to another object. So in this way, you can nest one object inside of the other. So here, I can now do a.boo.foo is three. And now we have a more complex object that has a do and a foo, then the do itself has a name, yay. So if I start here, I do dot boo, dot do, dot name, and I get yay. A dot boo dot do dot name. Does that make sense? You sure? Raise your hands if it does not. So we, we're ready for a quiz? We have, wow, some people are like, yeah, that's awesome. Great. OK, I'm not going to give you a quiz. Don't worry. OK. OK. So now we know how to set values on an object. What we can also do is initialize the object with existing values. So I can say, let's have const name be Joe. So what this means is that at this line here, A is an object which has a name of Joe. But then what happens here? We modify the name of the object, turning it into hello. So that means here, if I do console.log a.name, what will that print? Joe. But then if I do console.log 
a.name, that will print hello. Make sense? Nasty. Okay, so the constant is not, the, it, the internal values are not constants. What's a constant is the reference from A to the object. In other words, I can't do A is now 2 or 3. That is wrong. I can't do that because A is a constant, right? So it, the reference that A has to the object is constant. That does not change. But the values within the object are not constants. Make sense? Cool. Other questions? Yes? Yeah, so what this means is that name has a value of Joe. And then I can say age is 13, whatever, whatever. And I can keep adding things. Foo, bar, zoo. And I can keep going. Can we write constant for Joe, like constant age, 13, 14? Also, you can't change this. I have not seen that in the syntax. I'm not sure. I don't think so. So then, inside of zoo, I can do the same. I can say, you know, zoo has a name of yay, and bar has a, I don't know, 43. Whatever has true, right? And then inside here, I can create yet another object, which, has, which itself can have information in it. Does that make sense? Okay, so once I have this object, tell me, how can I get access, how can I refer to this value right here? A dot zoo dot? Perfect. That's it. Does that make sense? It's like creating a path within your object, right? Okay. How do I get to 43? Make sense? Okay, now let's change 43 to 55. How do I do that? Make sense? So at this stage here, right here, a.zoo.bar has a value of 43. Then it gets modified to 55, so after that, a.zoo.bar has a value of 55. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. So in the same way that we can add values to an object, we can also delete values from an object. Hang on, let me get rid of all this code. Okay, so suppose I want to remove name from A. <coughs> the way to remove it is by using delete. Delete a.name. That's it. Now if I do console.log a.name, what will print? Undefined, right, because name does not exist, right? See, undefined, very good. What if I were to print name above the deletion? Right, so it's Joe, we delete, then undefined. So we get Joe, undefined. Yes? Cool, okay. So we can add values and we can remove values. Okay, there's one more thing you should know. So the values, or the, I should say the names or the keys here, um, can't have spaces, just like variables. But if you want to have the key be a sentence, for example, you have to quote it. So you can actually wrap it with quotes. And then you can say, name is so much fun. And then now I have to refer to, now I can't do a dot name is so much fun. This is a syntax error in JavaScript. You can't have spaces in your variable names or your key names. But what you can do is open up a bracket, create a quote, close the quote, close it. Now this will return Joe. Does that make sense? So it depends on what you're doing. If you have, if you have a simple variable name, or a key name, you can just do a.name. But if you have something like name is so cool, you have to quote it. 
quote it. There you go. And then refer to it using that key. Does that make sense? OK. So tell me this. I want to have the key be hello world, and I want the value to be 3. What do I do? OK, but I could also do that, right? And then I can print it later. Console.log that. So this will now print 55. I could also have done this. I could just take this and make it as the initial value. You guys will often hear this term, initialization. OK, raise your hand if you've heard that, initializing something. OK. For those of you who have not, all initializing means is giving it an initial or a starting value. Okay? So whenever you're initializing something, it's saying when you first make it or build it or create it, giving it some values right there, right at that time, the starting values. So for example, you might want to create an object that is initialized with a name. That means when you're creating the object, right away you have name colon something. You have now initialized that object. That is to say, the moment it's been created, it already has a name. Or you can set a value later after the fact or modify the initialized value. Make sense? OK. So we understand objects? OK. What can we use an object for? No? Nothing? Some people have, some people have not. OK. Const b. I just created an object and put it into a variable called b. Yes? OK. Now, help me initialize this object with some data. Give me some data. Age? 18. Give me more initialization values. Name. I like this. Keep going. OK. OK, now, interesting. OK, so wait, wait, wait. So location is Yerevan enough? Because it's not as accurate, right? You just gave me a name of the city. So what we might want to do is have things like address, phone number, uh, what is it, address, phone number, city, country, right? We have all these extra things that we need, right? So what we could, exactly, we could have location refer to another object that inside now has country of Armenia, has a city of Yerevan, has a, or add, or, mm, yes, should, of, what is it, Bahreman? Uh, building number? I don't care, okay. <laughs> um, and a few other things, right, that you could imagine adding later on. So you, this makes sense, right? So now you, we have an object of Tatevik, age 18, that has a location of Armenia, Yerevan, Bahreman, and 49. So now later, if I want to render information about Tatevik, I can say b.name and get Tatevik. I can do b.age to get 18, and I can do b.location.country to get the country that Tatevik lives in. Make sense? Yay, it's, it's coming together, yes. If I just did this, so this would return b.location has a value of this, right? So that would return an object. So I could do const o. Now, what's inside of o? It's this, starting here, ending here, right? This is the value. This is the name, this is the value. Yes? OK, so now, how do I, can I do o.country? will give me Armenia. Yes? 
Is that clear? OK. Remember the other syntax. I could have also done, instead of b.location, opened up and said location. Same thing. Same thing happens. We refer to the location key within B. That again gives me back the object from which I can do O dot building and get 49. Can you console log all? Can you console log all? So it will give you something stupid like object object. If you do console dot log O, it will give you this, which is not very helpful. This, OK, so let me explain what that is. So every object in JavaScript has a function attached to it called toString. Okay? ToString is a function that is called in order to turn an object into a string. ToString, right? Now, it turns out by default, the toString function of every object that you make simply returns this ugly object object. It's actually the name of the constructor function, but don't, it doesn't matter. It just turns it into this ugly thing that's not very useful. But here's the cool part. You, as engineers, as programmers, can change the behavior of toString. Watch this. I can say, let's have, so here we printed O, we got object object, right? O has a two string on it, which I will change. I will write my own two string function. It will return, yay. And now when you print O, look what it prints. You get it? You can implement your own function that will stringify an object. You can say, yeah. You get the idea? If you modify, modify what? O, like change the content of O, it will still So first of all, you can't change the content of O because it's a constant. Let's begin with that. But let's suppose that it's a let here, and you change O. If you change O, it has lost the reference to location, right? But if you then find location again, this object has already been modified. So if you refer to it again, yes, it will still get yay. Make sense? OK. So it made sense to you, but nobody else. Let's see. What else can we do with objects? Well, let me talk about why objects are interesting. So you all use Facebook, I imagine, right? And if you think about it, when you make requests to the server, right, the first request that you make to the server returns to you the HTML page that then renders the overall structure of what you see, right? Then that HTML might have things like image tags inside with source references to images. Therefore, your browser will then make additional requests to download these images onto the client and then draw them in the various places. And that's how you see the pictures of your friends everywhere. Does that make sense? OK. Well, in addition to that, though, it might want to download just information, not files. Not images or JavaScript, but just information. Information such as the stuff you see in the newsfeed, right? So the things you did see in the newsfeed, the timeline that you get, is things like, you know, who did it, maybe their picture, the date when they did it, right? Um, the content, right? All of these parts. JSON. It's a description, right? It's, an, it's a list of objects where each object says, I was created at this time, this is the content, this is who made me, and then they have JavaScript that will read that information and then draw it for you in your timeline. Think of your messaging, right? Instant messaging, or you know, the, where you open it up and you say, hello, brief, right? And then that goes to your friend. Well, that's not a file, that's information. That's information that says who it's from, when you did it, right? It has all this extra metadata that describes the message in addition to the actual content of brief. All of that can be represented using a JavaScript object that is then trans or is sent to the server and then broadcasted to all the people that you're talking to so that they can see on their screen brief. Make sense? Sort of. What's another example? Imagine you're submitting a form, right? 
So in the form you have like, you know, name, email address, phone number, address, right? So you fill in the form. That information now has to be sent to the server, right? Well, one way you could do that is put all of that information into a JavaScript object with name, email, and so on, right? And then send that object to a server, which can then read these values and write them to a database, for example. And then later, if someone wants your information, they might want to make a request to the server, which will read this information and then send it to them. They then read it, the JavaScript object, and display it on the screen. Does that kind of make sense? Anyone completely lost here? OK, good. OK, now the next question is, once you have a JavaScript object, which is an object, right? How do you send that to the server? Because remember, the server just takes a string of bits, right? So it needs to take something like a string, just a contiguous sequence of stuff on its side. It turns out that there's this notion of JSON. JSON is nothing more than these JavaScript objects that are turned into a string. And then there is a, th a, some, a function that will turn it back into an object. Let me say this again. You start off with an actual object, which is the JavaScript object that we can play with, modify, do all the things that we want. There is a function that we will talk, talk about in a moment that will turn that object into a string. You can then send that string to the server. When it receives the string, it can then turn it back into an object and then use it. Make sense? A little bit? Yes. Yeah, literally. Let me show you what that looks like. So let me turn this B into a JSON, JSON string. So there's a, in your browsers and in most JavaScript execution environments, there's an object called JSON. That object has a function attached to it called stringify. You can then pass to it an object, and this will return to you a string. Let's print that string. There it is. Now let's, in fact, hang on. No, don't worry about that. OK, so you see this string here that we printed? Notice how it's the same stuff as here. So B has age of 18, name of Daltevik. Age of 18, name of Daltevik, location of, and that's an object that has a country of Armenia, a city of Yerevan, blah, 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 blah. This whole thing is just text. It's one long string. Once you have this string, you can then send it as text to the server. When the server receives the text, so this is the server part, so on the server, ha, ha, ha. Once we have the text, we can say json.parse and then take that string and that will return the object, which when I print is the actual object. So now from C, I can do c.age and get 18. I can do c.name and get .tevik. Again, for those of you who are confused, we start off with a JavaScript object. Listen, listen. We start off with a JavaScript object. We pass it to a function that then returns the stringified version of that object. That is to say, it turns the object into text. We can then later take that text, give it to another function that will bring it back into a live object. That is to say, it goes from string back into an actual object that we can work with. Does that make sense? Yes? You're sure? OK. Well, once you understand that, let's talk about, let's go back to Node. Yes? OK, so let's do, do an example of an image. So Datevik has an age of 18, a name of Datevik. And let's find a pup, puppy. Hang on. I love puppies, so let's do this. 
Okay, so let's uh, copy link. Hang on. One second. I'm almost there. Now you get to look at a cute picture of a puppy. The internet here is kind of slow. Uh, copy image address. Here we go. So this address that I copied, look, if I just go here, it's an address that returns to me an image. Do you remember we wrote this using Node? Remember, we would go to an address and get back a picture of a puppy? Now you know how this works, right? An HTTP request is made to a server. That's the path. This is the host name. What happened? Explain to me how this works. What happened? How did we get a picture of a puppy on the screen? All I did was put this into the address bar. What happened? Exactly. So first of all, this here, right? This dogtime.com. That is just a name. So the first thing that we have to do is go through, the, not we, the browser, is go through a resolution. We have to get the address of the server that has this picture, right? So we go to DNS, the domain name service, and we get back the number, which is the address. We then send a request to that address, and we pass this information, this path, if you will, as an argument, as information to the server. The server then reads this, whatever server is running dogtime.com, some computer, will read this path and say, oh, this client wants a, the picture of the puppy. So they read the file in, and send the file, which I then get on, the, on my side and draw it on the screen. Yeah? Yes? Good, okay. So now we have a cute picture of a puppy. Now, let's go back to our discussion. So here, let's say Taltevik is going to have a, a picture of that. Right? So now later, and I won't do this now because we haven't studied how to modify the HTML using JavaScript, but I could write JavaScript code here that would take this and put it as the source of an image tag on my page. And what would happen if I did that? If I were to create an image tag and then make the source this, what would happen? Exactly. The browser would then draw that image tag and drawing implies it would go to that address, download the picture, and then draw it, that is to say, put the pixels on the screen so you can see a puppy. Clear? Yes? Okay. So, once we have that, now if I serialize this, you will see that there is picture right there, and there's the URL that has been serialized as just a string value. Look, this URL, it's just text, right? Okay, so it serializes no differently from the word Datevik. It's just surrounded by quotes. Starting quote, ending quote, and then a bunch of stuff in between. Did that answer your question? Perfect. Yes? So you want to, uh, okay, so the example you gave is when you want to upload something. So we'll talk about file uploads later. Again, that also uses HTTP. That's also at its core just sending bits from the client to the server. The mechanism by which you would send that up to the server though is something that we will discuss very soon. Just, eh, it's a hasnumink, okay? But yeah, in the same way that the server can send us bits that have a file in it, we can send bits to the server that has a file in it. They're orthogonal. Um, other questions? before we continue. Is this clear? Did this clarify this whole notion of how to serialize an address? Yes? Yes, sir. Okay, good question. So um, suppose I send, I want to send you, look, look, look. I want to send you information, right? I want to send you information about your quizzes. So I want to tell you what the mean was, the median was, the mode was, the what's the other statistics I might remember? Whatever. Let's just say I want to send you those three things, right? Suppose I just send you one text, right? It's just one text. Inside of that, embedded in that text, is the information I just said, right? How are you going to get it out? It's just text, right? I just give you text. How are you going to know what the mean is? 
difficult. You're going to have to parse it, right? You're going to have to go take. Well, instead of that, we have this, which will automatically, you call the function, it parses it and just gives you an object that you can do dot mean, dot median, dot mode. Make sense? A little bit? Yeah. It will just print a string. It's just text. So stir is just text. Look, we have two functions, guys. Look, look. We have a JSON object. Attached to it are two functions, parse and stringify. Stringify takes an object, gives you a string. Parse takes a string, gives you an object. So they're, they, they do the opposite. Make sense? So for any object, you can give it, get a string. Any time later, you can give it to, to the parse function and get back an object. One of the reasons why this is really useful is because consider if you were to write your server code using a different programming language. Like if you were to write your server using Java or Ruby or Python or whatever. Well, it turns out there are libraries for parsing JSON in all of these languages. So even though you created your JavaScript object using JavaScript, once you turn it into JSON, other languages can now understand that object because it can be deserialized into objects represented by other languages. So this JSON is a standard. It's a way of communicating structured data between two endpoints. So if we make strings with JavaScript, yeah. Yes, so C++ has a library that given a string, because every language has a notion of strings. In C++, they have character, right, a list of characters, which is basically a string. But suppose that's your input. Okay, you can then call a function, which will then give you back C++ objects that represent exactly this data, right? So this way you can communicate with different languages. Uh, other questions? Yes. So, for example, we send a message like, uh, to uh, change the object. Uh-huh. Same way it works. One more time. So, we send a sentence. Yes. Like, uh, so, a sentence is just a string, right? OK, so you're saying I want to send a sentence to someone? Yes. OK. So, if, if all you're doing, look, look, if all you're doing is sending string, you can just send the string. The problem is, suppose you want to send information, like other details. What is the string? Suppose the string is name, but you also want age, phone number, address, location, date, right? Now you have to, how do you, how do you represent that? The way to do it is maybe by using JSON. Hmm? Uh, other questions? Keep going? Yes? You can, but okay, so good question. So uh, the question was, uh, why can't we just send text and then use this notion of regular expressions, which for those of you who don't know, doesn't matter. It's all it's saying, all it means is that she can un try to parse, that is to say, read the text, and from reading the text, try to understand the different parts of the text. Hmm? You can. The problem with that is you have to do a lot of work, number one. Number two, in order to do that, you have to make assumptions on the format. How is the text structured so that you can parse it, right? So either way, there has to be a standard. Now, it just so happens that it probably does use regular expressions underneath, but it's inside of a function that you can just use. How's that, Sasha? Thank you. Other questions? Good? So we understand JSON a little bit. OK, we studied objects. Now let's study arrays. So arrays are actually just objects where the keys are numbers rather than text. So before, we had keys like name, age, location, right? Well, in an array, the keys are numbers. So watch this. Let's have b be an array. b3 is, hello. B0 is, yay. What is B1 right now? 
Undefined, that's right. It, this key does not have a value yet, right? Okay, well, what if I were to do this? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. If I then did B uh, one, what would I get back? Two, right? So this is the zero index, this is the one index, so I would get back two. What if I did B3, what would I get back? You see this? We modified the value that is in index 3. If I were to read B3 here, it will be 4. But here, it's hello. Make sense? If you think about it, the syntax is very similar to what we saw in objects. You open up a bracket, you specify a number, you close the bracket. The number represents your key. Okay? Now, an array has one additional feature, which is its length attribute. So I can do b.length, which, if you recall, length of an array is the last index plus one. What is the last index here? Right, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, plus 1 gives you 5. Therefore, the length of this array is 5. Does that make sense? Okay, well, what if I did this? What if I did b index of 5 is whatever? Okay. What is the length now? 6. The last index plus 1. a dot length would give me 6. Let me console log so you can see. Oh, I made a syntax error somewhere. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Is that clear? Yes? Okay, remember these are the initial values, right? Therefore, I have initialized my array with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Why am I spending all this time talking about initialization? So when I was studying programming, people kept saying, let's initialize your object with 5. I had no idea what they meant by that. And for a long time, everyone knew except me. I was the only one sitting in class going, what is initializing something with a 5? Like, I couldn't understand it. It's really simple. Again, it's giving it a starting value, an initial value. Initial value, initialization. Huh? Cool? OK. So when I say, so b is initialized with 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And then later, we modify values within b, the 0 index with yay, 3, three index with hello, 5 index with OK. Make sense? OK. Last index plus one. What is the last index here? Why is, it, why is it last index plus one? Okay, I'll tell you. Look. How many boards are there? How many? Three. If this is the first one, what index is it? What index is this? What index is this? Right. How many boards are there? The number is. But then the index of the last one is four. That's five. Look. Zero, one, two, three, four. Here we added a fifth index. Right? So at this point, we actually have a, another. Oh, we have. This happens at the end because of this. Let's go through a debugger. Okay, look. So B has these values in it, right? For 0 it has a 1, for 1 it has a 2, blah, 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 blah. Yes? And the length is the last index plus 1, which is 5. Yes? Let's keep going. We change the 0 to a yay. There it is. We change the 3 to hello. There it is. And then we set 5 to OK. The length is now 5 plus 1, which is 6. 
Does that make sense to everyone? Yes? People are a little lost, but okay. Okay, I got one for you. Ready? B, 1000. What is B dot length? Very good. The last index, plus one. But wait, so what is uh, B of, let's say, I don't know, 10? Exactly. So what we have now is an array. OK, so tell me, what does the array have at this point? What does the array, what does the array look like here, right here? What's inside of B right now? Yay. And then a whole bunch of undefineds. OK, just so that we don't freeze my browser, let's say 50, right? And let's have a debugger here. So at this point, B just has this. So it has a value for 50, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and 0. And everything else, it does not have a value for. If it doesn't have a value, the value is undefined. Yes? Make sense? That's why if I did B you know, index of, say, 49, I would get undefined, because there is no 49 here. Does that make sense? Yes? 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 Yeah, so you can, what do you mean add, so you can do console log uh, b dot length plus one, is that what you mean? Modify it, like length equals something. Mm -hmm. You can, okay, you can change the values within the array during the thing. Length will update based on the content of the array. Remember, last index plus one. Got it? Other questions? Yes? Do we have, sorry, do we have what? Associative arrays. We do. But don't use them. Use an object. So an object is basically, it's a key value pair. An associative array is a key value pair, except it's using an array structure instead of an object structure, right? You can, in, in, so you can actually here do this. You can do b foo, like that. You can do that. But don't, because if you're going to do that, just have b be an object, and you get the same results, and it's faster, because it doesn't have to worry about length and keeping, doing all the bookkeeping, right? So don't use an associate, not in JavaScript. In JavaScript, just use an object. Good question. Other questions? Yes? Sorry. Go one more time. Oh, how are you going to find the index? OK, good question. OK, so there was a question of, suppose we have an array. So this is a good sample we can try. Imagine we have an array with a bunch of values in it. And, and, the, the, and we want to build a function that will give us the index of a certain value. Watch. Suppose I have an array that has in it B, C, D, E. Let's write a function that takes an array, and let's call that with B, and let's print the result. We have to write code here, write code here. So we have to write code there that will return the index in which Let's pass another argument, C is in. 
Do you understand the problem? We want, hang on, see. Let's write code that will return the index of value inside of array. For loop. For loop. Yeah. You guys remember the old for loop? For, what's the, tell me, talk to me. Is E I, is that what you guys keep saying E? Say I. Is zero, yeah. Okay, so this array will iter will loop length minus well length min length times, right? Yes? So how many do we have here? One, two, three, four, five. So this loop will loop five times. Okay, now what? And if nothing, you don't have to break. Return means finish, right? That's it. Done. Okay. And if I can't find it, what can I do? Yeah. Let's return a negative one if we can't find anything. So now if the, hang on. What do I do? Oh. Thank you. Interesting. Oh. There we go. Okay. So here, let me make this a little clearer. Okay. Let's go through a debug. So first stare at this for a while. Look at the code. Talk about the code. We could have done the same thing using a while loop, you're right. So let's actually go through a debugger. OK, look. Hang on, let me make this a little bigger. OK, so at this point we have a B that has this, these values in it, yes? OK, we make a function, we call the function with the array and C. So now, R has the array and value has C. Value has C. So now what we do is we create I is 0. As long as I is less than array.length, what is length? 5. See? Well, no, last index. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, plus 1, that's 5. Yes? So as long as I, which is now 0, is less than 5, we're going to keep going. We check R i. Well, i is 0, so 0 has a value of a. You see? i is 0. We check the 0 of array. 0 of array has a. Is a the same as value, which is c? Moment. Value of c. Is that the same as that? Yes or no? No. So we keep going. Is so now i is 1. Is b the same as c? No. How about now? So we return i, and i now has a value of 2. So result has a value of 2. We then print 2 and get that. OK, what if I did, instead of c, I did e? What do I get now? Okay, why? Because 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, yes, that's correct. What if I did A? What if I did that? This will never be true, so it will finish looping, come here and do return of minus 1. We could have also done 
no index found. Whatever you return here is what it will return, right? Negative one is good. Does this make sense? Questions about this? No questions? Okay. Didn't that, you guys had a homework on arrays, right? What were you supposed to do? Reverse them? You know what's funny? I was about to be like, let's write a reverse function. Then <laughs> I went, wait. Okay, so let's not do that. Um, okay, I know. Let's have an array that has a bunch of values in it. Yes. Either one. Either one. Uh, so imagine we write a function that is given an array and then returns another array where for every value inside it adds whatever this is. So if this was 2, it would do 2 plus 3, 2 plus 4, 2 plus 5, 2 plus 6, 2 plus 7, and return the new value. Does that make sense? Yes. So let's see how we could write that. So let's call uh, const results f of b and value of, say, 5. So let's add 5 to everything. Let's print that. OK, so let's write code here. So remember, we want to return a different array that has the original array values plus the value that was given to us as an argument. Do you guys understand the problem? OK. Offer me a solution. OK, so we're going to do a for loop for let i is 0, i is less than what? Cool, OK, that's perfect, except one thing. You're modifying the existing array, right? Exactly. So let's do const, I don't know, local array. And let's instead have this be there. And then what do we return? John, beautiful. Dum, da, dum. OK. Let that sink in for a while. Just look at it for a while. Try to understand it. Now let's debug. OK. So we start off by making an array and putting it into B. The array is initialized with 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 values. Here they are. And the length is 5. So far, so good? Good. We make a function. We call the function with b, which is the array, and 5, which is the value. So now array has 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and value has a value of 5. There it is. With me so far? We then construct another array that we store into a variable called local array. Question. Can I refer to this local array from out here? No. 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 Very good. OK, let's keep going. So in the, we make a for loop that's going to loop for every value inside of array. So i is 0 as long as i is less than array.length. i is equal to i plus 1 is what's going to happen on each cycle. We go here. So i is now 0, right? So what is r 0? What will this part here return? 3, because index of 0 has 3, right? Watch. So this 3, we then add it to value, which as you recall has a value of 5. 3 plus 5 is? So we store that into the 0 index of my local array. So now my local array has 0 index 8. 
let's keep going. i is now 1. In array, 1 has a value of 4, right? So we do 4 plus 5. What does that give us? 4 plus 5? 9. And we put that into the 1 index of my local array. So now we have 8 and 9. And we keep doing this for every value. We add 5 to every value and put that into the new array. And now my local array has 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, which is 5 more than every value in here. Make sense? Raise your hands if you couldn't write this. OK, one honest person. Anyone else? Two people. Yeah, you could also do this. Actually, map would be an ideal function, in fact. Yeah, yeah. But I'm trying to, I want you to write the code first and then use these helper methods later. So this is harder to do than to use map. But I want you to learn the hard one first. Um, OK. So question to those of you who raised your hands. Did you raise your hand because you just don't think you'll memorize the syntax or that you just don't understand it? Raise your hand if you just don't understand it. OK, so it's just you're worried that you wouldn't remember what characters to put in there, the syntax. OK, no problem. So for that, the solution for remembering OK, OK, OK. So this is a great point. So let, let's talk about this for a moment. So um, many of you have come to me and said, look, when you explain code, we understand it, right? We understand the parts of the code, and we understand what you're doing. But the problem that many of you have is trying to imagine how to do it yourself. So if you were to just be given a blank piece of paper, and I would just tell you, write this, you wouldn't really understand or remember what structures, what constructs to use in order to put that idea into code, right? That is to say, translating what's in here into code is not yet intuitive to you. Is that a fair point? Yeah. OK. So consider this. Uh, with any language, right? It doesn't matter what language you learn, right? Just think of French or Chinese, anything. Just learning the rules and memorizing syntax and grammar is not going to be enough, right? You have to use it. The best way to learn French is to move to France, right? The, mo the more you use a language, the better versed you will be. Fair? So with programming, it's the exact same thing. The more code you write, the better you will understand how to write code. OK? So there are a few ways you can do this. One way that I recommend is to watch YouTube videos of other programmers writing code. Because when you follow, they say, I want to build this, and you follow how they do it, you see the steps that they take in order to produce the idea, right? So then you can try to go through the same steps yourself. The other thing, the node examples that I put up, the one in Git, try to read them one at a time, one at a time. Open it up, read it, understand it, close it, write it yourself. Go to the next one. Read it, close it, write it yourself. This will allow this because reading it and saying, OK, I got it, is not the same as actually being able to do it. Make sense? Then, once you're able to do it, try to change it. OK? So, if in the code there's one if statement, add more. Add more if statements. Uh, return different strings, right? Dif play with different numbers. Try to add variation to the code. That's dangerous. That's dangerous, but it's worth it. This will get your hands dirty with actually trying to play with the code. The more you play with code, the better you will understand code. And after you do this a long time, eventually you will become skilled enough that you can, when you have an idea, not only will you come up with a way of doing it, but here's the difference between a good programmer and a not so good programmer, is you will be able to come up with a really good way of doing it. Not just a way, but a good way, right? An optimal way, a good algorithm, OK? So again, for this, you just have to write a lot of code. Now, when you guys build your projects, this will give you the opportunity to really explore and try writing lots of code. The homework assignments have not been that complicated up until this point, right? Most of the complexity, from what I understand, has been with making YouTube videos. Fine. But 
very soon, now that we have Node, and soon we'll learn a little bit of client-side JavaScript with jQuery, a whole world is going to open up for you, and we are going to be building fairly complicated database-driven web applications. And I don't know if you guys remember me saying this, but you guys are going to write your own database. You're not going to use Mongo or MySQL. You're going to write your own. That's harder. But the idea is, if you can understand what it takes to build a database, learning how to use someone else's database is much, much easier. Right? Make sense? OK. What time is it? Oh, we have like five minutes. OK. So guys, watch. Remember that objects are values. So in the same way that I can have text in here, I can have objects in here. There's an object. There's another object. Let's have a whole bunch of them. You know what? I got tired of writing all of these objects, objects, objects. I want to create an array with 10 objects. What do I do? OK, but let's, let's keep it even simpler. For, uh, why don't we do a while loop? Let i be 0 while i is what? Less than 10. Let's do b of, hello. Oh, crap, I'm in an infinite loop. Hang on. That's why I said expand Oh. Uh, hang on. Wait, that's not what I want. Ah, uh, OK, hang on. Wait, 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 wait. Wait for it. OK, let's do this again. Let i be 0 while i is less than 10. I'm going to purposely not close it. Hang on. OK. So if I were to just do a console log here, I get 10 yays. Do you see why? i starts off with 0. As long as i is less than 10, we do a print. We increment i by 1. We come here, is 1 less than 10? Yes. We print, less than 2? Yes. We do this until it gets to, until it gets to what? What will this print? Why? Beautiful. Look, this has to be false for this to leave the loop. In order for this to be false, I if, nine, if it's 9, it's not false. It will go into the loop. I has to be 10 for it to be false, and then it breaks out of the loop. And then you, you get 10. By the way, that's an interview question. Programming interview question, just so you know. OK, so now instead of just type of printing yay, let's, do, let's make an array. Const b is an array. And let's have b of i create, be an object. Now what I have at this point is b, which has how many objects inside? 10 objects. So in 0 you get an object, in 1 you get an object, and all the way until 9. Right? OK. So now let's have this object have a value in it of i. Now let's write a function that will increase this value by 1. Eh? Watch. It takes an array, b, and a, well, just b. And then we're going to go for let i is 0, i is less than b dot length, i plus plus. Then we do b of i dot value equals b of i dot value plus 1. Yeah. Of 
OK. Let's go through this code very quickly. All right, look, here's what we did. We make an array that we place into B. Can the people in the back see the code? OK. Uh, then we make an i. Is i less than 10? Well, i is 0. Obviously, it's less than 10. So we go in. We say b index of i, which is 0, is going to have in it an object with a value name and i. So now, if we look at b, it has an object which has a value of 0. Yes? OK. Then we keep doing that 10 times. And OK, so now B has a whole bunch of objects, each of which has a value of whatever index it's in. Right? OK. We then call F, which we step into, which then is going to loop over every one and say B of I, well, B of I is going to be the, the object inside of the array, dot value plus one. And we're going to modify the existing value with the new one. And we keep doing that 10 times because there are 10 values in there. OK, so now B has original was 0, it's now 1. Original was 1, it's now 2. Original was 3, it's now 4. So we've increased every value by 1. Does that make sense? A little bit? OK. So now watch this. One more thing, and then I'll let you go. So remember how I said you can have an object inside of an array? Well, you can also have an array inside of an object. So let's have this be the object. b.foo can be an array, which can have 1, 2, and, two and 3 inside. In fact, the array can have other objects. And those objects can have arrays. Arrays can have arrays inside. These are called multidimensional arrays. Arrays can have arrays inside of arrays. <laughs> Somebody stop him. OK, so now watch this. B.foo index of Miropa. Zero, that's zero. That's one, that's two. OK, so index of two. Index of, so within this, zero, one, and two. Index of two, index of zero. What's that going to return? One. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so look, it's not that hard. It's really not that hard. Look. So we understand that b of foo refers to this whole value, right? So that's what this does. Two, what is two inside of this array? Well, there's one. There's two. Sorry, that's zero. That's one. So this array must be the two, right? So it's this. Then within that, we take two, so not that, not that, but that. So that's this array here. And then within that array, we take zero, which is the one. We'll talk about multidimensional arrays more later. Don't worry. Let's take a photo and boogie. Uh, <laughs> I'm so of Kevin. Hey! Uh.